Hey there, friends. Have you run out of clucks? I'm keeping this PG, but you know what I mean. Like, do you ever feel completely burned out or have times when your mind, body, and heart get out of sync? I know I do. And it's happening more often than it did in the past. As much as we like to blame everyone else for our issues, my guest today says you need to own your stuff. That's not exactly what she says, but I'm going to let her tell you. <laughs> What that, how that idiom, that catchphrase goes. Crystal, Crystal Jakowski of Colorado is a dynamic speaker, survivor, and educator who helps people find their voice. She coaches others to own who they are and feel free enough to let others do the same. I'm going to repeat that in case you missed it. Feel free enough to let others do the same. And I got to admit, that sounds rather lovely. Welcome to Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson. I'm your host, Dr. Mo, best-selling author, award-winning podcast host, keynote speaker, and speaker coach. My goal for every episode is to elevate, educate, and motivate you. Joining me now is Crystal Jakowski, podcaster, teacher, and visionary. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you so much, Dr. Mo. I'm excited to be here and to connect and chat with you today. So we had a, we had a great pre-call. You are so fun and so knowledgeable. And I just really, really like what you're teaching. It's so important. Let's start with what does it mean to own your stuff? Yeah. <laughs> You know, we we are all raised in different ways. We have our parental units, we have school, we have any religion that was there. We have the community and the society that we live in and all of the expectations that are there. And oftentimes we move around, which means we're adjusting to additional communities. You know, we have to learn how to adjust to what's around and we have to learn how to fit in. The thing is that at some point, we have to stop fitting in and start being true to ourselves. There's some point that comes and we realize that we're not really happy with mm -hmm. our lives and where we're at. And that's when we have to own our stuff and recognize that we have made the choices that brought us here. I'm not saying we chose into trauma. I'm not saying we chose into the extremely difficult stuff. What I am saying is that our responses and the way that we move forward from there are our choices. Mm -hmm. And that means that feeds into how we react to people in the future. So the way that you had an experience as a child, you turn around and as an adult, you have an, alt an altercation or a fight with your partner. And it's because it triggered emotion and fear and feelings from that previous experience. So I feel like I'm off on a tangent a little bit, but basically owning your stuff means that you'd stop in that moment where you're arguing with your partner and you say, why am I so upset? Why am I so angry? You recognize that there is underlying emotion. You recognize that the experience you had from the past is feeding into this right now. And you need to change that. You need to own your experience instead of lashing out at people because they're triggering you from your experiences. You recognize my experiences, my emotions, my thoughts are what feed into this whole experience. I don't like the experience. I want to change it. So I'm going to look at my choices that have brought me here. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. The, the thing is, for me, within that moment, it's hard to be that introspective when somebody's pushing your buttons and, and triggering you. And this is very fresh for me because we're in the midst of the holidays <laughs> as we record this. And I, yeah. and I had an incident recently. I have to say, I was proud of myself that I was able to just kind of remain quiet and not feed into what was going on. But inside, I was really losing it. There was nothing, nothing mild or calm about it. And I was upset for days. So yeah. as you're Owning your stuff, and I guess that was a way of reacting passively because then I just walked away. But is there a way to, within that moment, to realize what's going on and how you're being triggered? Because that I just was like, just put up a wall and mm -hmm. really wasn't dealing with what was happening. I was just really angry, even though you couldn't tell 
from looking at me. So so walk me through how you might do that. Cause I, I talk to friends and I know I'm not the only one because you get so professional that you know not to lose your stuff, but how do you own it within that moment? Right. You put on that mask and say, okay, I'm not gonna let him know I'm ticked off. Here's my tip for you. On a an emotional scale of one to ten, ten being off the charts, yelling, screaming, fire coming out of your head. And one, you are as calm and peaceful as possible. If you're above a three, a three, the issue is with you, not the other person. Mm. The upset wow. that you are experience, experiencing in that moment is coming from behind. It's coming from other experiences. It is coming, feeding into, which means that if I've gone above a three, I need to stop and say, why? am I above a three? If your partner is above a three, then you can say, I see you're really passionate about this and you're mm -hmm. really upset. And maybe we should take a moment and breathe and come back to it. The thing is that this comes down to communication, right? right. It comes down to, because in the beginning, it's really hard for us to go, oh, I'm above a three. I don't care that I'm above a three. I'm really pissed off. <laughs> exactly. I just want to go. Um, once you start looking, once you start pausing and seeing it, then it gets easier to. It's like going to the gym and building a muscle. Sometimes we need to work that out and have that communication and vocabulary with our partners. Because mm -hmm. when I first started doing this with my partner, I could look at him and say exactly that. Hey, I see you're really passionate and upset about this. Can we revisit it later? And it would give him pause. He'd get a little frustrated that I was calling him out and he would want to dive into it even more. And I would be able to put my own walls up because I don't have to take on his stuff, right? Right. He has his and I have mine and I don't have to allow that to continue. And in the same aspect, in the reverse, he would, he would say the same to me, only he would literally say, you're above a three. <laughs> But he was trying. He was trying. He was using the words and the trick that I have taught people to help me. And I would say, I am. Okay, why? The more that you do it, the more that you dive into it, the more that you see it, the easier it is and the quicker the answers come to you, right? The right. first few times you're going to be really frustrated and you're not really going to want to look back at what feeds into that fear? What feeds into that anger? What feeds into that moment? It's going to be a little bit difficult, but as time goes on and you do it more often, you can sit there and say, oh, I got it. This is feeding into the fact that I always had to do the dishes after dinner and I would get in trouble if they weren't all completely done. So having one dish on the counter absolutely drives me nuts because back then I would get in trouble and it's frustrating that you're not getting in trouble because you don't do the dishes. Right. right. So evidently I need to deal with the fact that I am scared and frustrated and have emotional baggage. And I would appreciate you being understanding of the fact that I'm struggling and then we can work together so that it's less of a contention and more of an understanding and compassion between the two of us. Got it. Got it. You just made me think of something interesting with my sons, my two sons, when they were younger and we are long past this, they're in their thirties with <laughs> you know, kids and I got grandkids and stuff, but, and it, it, it is related. It was me with insisting they make the bed every day, not only make it, but make it a certain way. And we had so many arguments about that ridiculous thing. And my bed isn't made right now because I'm so far removed from that because I didn't have time this morning. I had stuff to do, but growing up, that was a thing in my household. And I get in trouble if it wasn't made. And I just carried that into, you know, my raising children. And it just really doesn't matter. I've even seen research that people do better who don't make it every day. There's not as many germs that it has to air out and all, all kinds of stuff. But um, and that's not so much an argument because they would just do what I said, but the attitudes and the, you know, just pulling up the the comforter, but the sheet was <laughs> done. And the time we wasted on that and a dinner ritual and so many other things, you just like this whole light bulb went off. So many yeah. other things that I was putting on them simply because they were traditions and put on me and okay. So that's what feeds into you. So you've just, you just brought it all right to home because yeah. the whole concept is that if you own your stuff, 
if you are more self-aware, you are less upset about other people because you now recognize that this is my stuff and they're going to have their own stuff and you're going to be less triggered and upset by them and you are going to allow them to be themselves as well. It spreads this open acceptance of where we're at instead of you need to shift and change to fit the mold that I believe we're all supposed to be in. Right. It's, no, you know what? I recognize the mold that I was in or am in is not the mold I want to be in. And that's probably going on for you too. And that has to extend to our parents, right? Mm -hmm. If we want the freedom and the ability to claim that we're really good parents, we kind of have to look at our parents and say, oh, you know what? You thought you were a good parent too, because you were adjusting from your parents, from their parents, from their parents. Like there, there is this new understanding and mm -hmm. this new um, gentleness that we can give to each other, recognizing that we're all doing the best that we can to create lives that are wonderful and fantastic. And where is room for judgment in that? Why can't we just love each other? Right. That part. And, and from generation to generation, as we have new experiences and new information and new studies, you know, my mom was the Dr. Spock model of raising kids. And I had with the Internet, so many other resources and, and moving around so many other friends. And that that helped me a lot to see that, you know what, is there are a lot of different ways you can parent and then you have to be sensitive to the needs of your children. But what you say with your partner, I want to revisit that because I guess we're talking about limiting beliefs and, and things we inherit from, you know, our parents and the dynamics of our relationships. Within that moment, though, it sounds like your partner, I know at first he was probably frustrated because a lot of people feel like, no, I want to talk about it now. This is going on right now. And we got to deal with this right now. And I find it so much better to have that cooling off period. But if you're dealing with someone who's just going on and on and they won't let you have that pause, have that room, tell me, tell me a strategy to deal with that. Um, it's funny because I became the master. He was the teacher initially. Um, my parents fought. And so I learned to fight. My mm -hmm. first husband's parents fought. So they learned to fight. And um, when I started dating my now husband, um, he one night we were talking about how I was dealing with something. And he very calmly said, I'm getting really upset right now. So I think I'm going to leave and we'll chat about this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And he left my house and I was like, who the heck are you Just leave in the middle of an argument? We are supposed to be fighting this out. We are supposed to be like arguing until one of us wins, whatever mm -hmm. is being fought over. And he didn't do that. He left, which then I'm sitting there like, what just happened? Because he didn't raise his voice. I had no clue that he was upset in any way, shape, or form. I just knew that he disagreed with what I was saying and doing. Mm -hmm. So I, that was the first time that I learned, and it was very much demonstrated to me that you can walk away from an argument. Mm -hmm. And the next day, we came together, and we talked about it, and it resolved. We were able to come to an understanding. And Calmly calm without any yelling without any punches without any anything it was just and i don't mean physical punches i just mean punches going back mm -hmm. and forth um it was so different so as i've we've now been married almost 12 years and it's funny because now something will come up and he will be frustrated and he will start going at you know verbalizing and trying to talk about this and i will say i see you're really upset and I think we should come at this later and I will leave the room and he will follow me around the house <laughs> trying to continue talking about this. And I finally turn around and I, I don't respond because at that point I have acknowledged that whatever he is upset about is not me. Mm -hmm. It is not something I have done. It is not with me or it is, or my job to fix it. Fix it, is it. Literally yes. His job to acknowledge the upset and deal with it. Mm -hmm. So at, from that point on, I do not engage. I acknowledge that he's upset. I do not engage. He follows me around and then I stop and I turn around and I look at it and I say, you are really upset. I need space so that we can breathe and come back at this. If you want to continue, then we will be fighting and yelling and probably saying things that we don't want to say to each right. other because they will be hurtful. 
Like I literally spell it out. Mm -hmm. Do you want to continue coming at me this way because we'll have an issue or would you like to take a break? And when he looks at it that way, when it comes back to literally like kindergarten, oh yeah, I got it. And mm -hmm. then he'll give me a break and he'll go and he'll come back later. And it might be 20 minutes later. It mm -hmm. might be the next day when he comes back and says, you know what? You were absolutely right. I was upset about this that happened, not you and what was going on. So now let's talk about you and I and how our relationship is instead of that. So once you recognize whether it's you or the other person, you have to take that break and you have to set that boundary. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you have to say, I'm not going to take that on because we do not deserve it from other people. If they are above a three, this is, this is a fortress, baby. I'm not allowing you to come at me. I do not need your arrows and your swords and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. And I do not need to have a shield that is still physically battering me. I have a brick wall there. I'm mm -hmm. not going to take on your anger, but that's a boundary that I have to hold, right? right? I have to say I am worth more than that. And I am not going to allow you to tear me down in your upset and your frustration. It's that person on the road, you know, you're driving down and mm -hmm. you know, you need to merge over and somebody does not want to let you in. And as you finally pass, they like give you the finger and they're showing all these darts at you. And you're mm -hmm. like, okay, you're upset, but I'm not going to continue driving like a maniac because... I don't have to take on the darts that you were just sending at me. Right. We have the ability to put ourselves higher on the value, you know, the spectrum. We have the ability to acknowledge our own issues, our own challenges, say that's okay. I love myself anyway. And because I love myself and I'm going to own my stuff, you, we can expect other people to own theirs too. That's good. That's good. To your analogy of the car with the road rage person <laughs> too, it's interesting that especially now that everybody's just a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. anxious and worried about, you know, who's got a weapon or who knows who's going to do what. That's interesting to me that, say, in that situation or in the office or with strangers, some people can control themselves because I don't want to be hurt and I don't want to hurt that person. If I drive up on their bumper, if I start waving at them, trying to get off the road. But then when they when they get with a significant other, they can't seem to be able to do that. And why is that? What is that about that the people you're closest to, you don't want to? Own your stuff. You don't want to control yourself. Uh, what happens there? It's a safe space. Mm, wow. Our, love, our loved ones are absolutely safe spaces. So we can let most of our guard down and we can just be really who we are. So when you're at work, you have to have a mask on and you have to mm -hmm. act the way that they need you to be at work and you're doing your job and you have put your best foot forward. But when it comes to home, you get to take your shoes off. Right. You get to get comfortable. That also means that you are vulnerable. So that means that our loved ones can unintentionally or sadly intentionally on occasion push our buttons. It means that because we are relaxed, we are more open to criticism or perceived criticism. Mm -hmm. um, and it also means that we might tend to be more critical of other people because they are a safe space. My kids, when I went through my divorce, my kids were lashing out at me all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I went to counselor after counselor to try to understand it. And I finally found one that I absolutely loved. And we worked really, really well together. And he said to me, you have to understand that your home is a safe space for them to allow the anger out, for them to allow the fear and the upset to come out. It's not that they're angry at you. It's that they have had all of this other external influence going on in their lives. And when they come home, they know that it's safe to blow up and then come back to a safe, calm space. When we are out at work, we have had our walls up and people have been attacking our walls. Mm -hmm. um, like there's so many examples going through my head and we just don't have all the time in the world to go over those examples. But um, we're out in the world, 
we are being attacked. We are trying to protect ourselves. We are dealing with every single thing from the boss to the road rage, to harassment, to just everything. Maybe we ate something and digestively, we're not feeling good. We come home and where did you release all of that upset? Where did you take a moment to let go of all of the darts that had been thrown at you all day long? There's a story about this man who um, lived with his family out in the country, right? And he worked, mm -hmm. he went to work every day and he'd walk out the front door and he would touch the leaves of this tree. And then he would get into his car and he would go to work. And when he came home, he would touch the leaves of the tree and then he would go in and be with his family. And one night he brought his boss home with him and his boss watched him touch the leaves of the tree and then go into the house. And then when they came back out of the house and he had to take his boss home, his boss asked him, why did you do that? And he said, I want to put all of my cares in the world on this tree hmm. so that when I go into my home, I am clear and able to connect with my family. And when I leave my house, then I pick those cares of the world back up before I go so that I can deal with it. But he always got rid and let it go. What do we do? to let go of all of that crap that has come out at us in the world before we turn and work with our family. That's a, that's because a beautiful we, story. Yeah. We carry it home. We do. We carry it home. We take it into them. They deal with it. If we had a really crappy day, our boss yelled at us, we failed a deadline, we dropped coffee all over ourselves, we, whatever it was, and then we come home and we're irritable because our day sucked. Mm -hmm. Our family is the one that suffers from it. Right. Because we didn't take a moment to recognize, where am I at? What do I need to do so that I can walk through that door and let go? We treat those who are closest to us the worst. Because right. they are the safe space that we can let go. They do not deserve it. And the only way to change that radical self-awareness and owning our stuff so that we can shift that narrative so that we can change it and be more kind and loving to our partners. Very nice. That's going to bring a lot of uh, peace and comfort to people who, who learn to use the, the strategies that we're talking about here. And just, you know, Remember how important your family is to you, that, that that's a meaningful, personal, deep relationship. And that is that is not the place to, you know, be destructive. Yeah. And that, that's something we can we got into and we can get out of. Let's let's go to a, another uh, end of this spectrum or this arc and talk about um, beating burnout. How do we beat and avoid burnout because i i'm seeing so much of that uh within my circle and just just nationally now that we can hear everybody's feelings on social media <laughs> and and it's is is somewhat alarming uh because that that goes into our mental health and that also impacts our family yeah burnout is huge um I talk to people and a lot of people believe that it's something that more women deal with because of the family and the expectations that are on women just as that general generalization. And I, I disagree with that. I think every single human being on this planet deals with burnout in one way or another. Some Agreed. of us are more vocal about it and share about it. And some of us really suffer in silence and fail to speak up saying I'm having this problem. Mm -hmm. Burnout. Burnout really comes about because we are giving too much and not paying attention. We, each and every one of us is a finite resource. So that again, you are a finite resource. There is only so much of you to go around you and your energy. The most valuable thing in this life is not time. It is energy. It is not money. It is energy. Energy is what leads to burnout. Your phone needs to be plugged in or it's not going to work. Right. Your car needs gas or it needs to be plugged in or it's not going to work. They have to recharge if they do not function. You mm -hmm. are the exact same thing. Burnout comes about 
because you have failed to pay attention to your own needs and met them. Now, this feeds into your four bodies, okay? You have a spiritual body, which is your connection to your higher power. Mm -hmm. You have a mental body, which is all of the thoughts that you think throughout the day. You have your physical body, which is how you experience the world around you. And then you have an emotional body, which is literally the emotions that you are feeling. And your emotions let you know when something's wrong. Okay. When I talk about burnout, I talk about all four of these bodies and burnout because you can burn out any which way. Physically, if you burn out, you may have twisted an ankle or broken a leg or had mm -hmm. some large physical medical thing that takes you down. You may get the flu or COVID or something else that really takes you out for a little while because physically you literally need a break and your body has told you we're not doing anymore. Mentally, you can burn out, right? You are working, you are going, you are doing, you are thinking, you are helping all the time. And then suddenly you can't think anymore and you're not clear and you can't remember. Well, you pushed too hard. Emotionally, when you burn out, it is literally, you have emotional breakdowns. And spiritually, when you burn out, it is, you've lost that connection to your spiritual power. And I need to bring all these in and explain them to you because when you experience burnout, the first thing is recognizing that in one of these four bodies, you have burned out because each body affects the other body. Each body will help drain or encourage and boost the other ones, right? Mentally, you can think positively about your body, which is going to boost you up and give you more energy. And then your emotions are happier and whatnot, right? right? So the first thing to burn out is recognizing that you've already drained one of your resources completely to the point there is nothing left. That finite resource is nil. It is gone. And, and I think everybody knows that feeling too. I got nothing left, <laughs> nothing to right. give. I got nothing to give mentally, physically, emotionally, whatever it is, I got nothing to give. So when I talk about burnout, recognize that you have burned out and then tune in which one of your bodies is, has hit the wall. And then what can you do to fix that? What can you give yourself? Do you need some healthy food? Do you need some time to meditate and break away from the world? Do you need a nap so that your brain can regenerate? Do you need a vacation where you're not looking at your phone and dealing with work all the time? Do, what do you need emotionally to help refuel what's no longer available to you? Your emotions let you know when something's wrong. Your emotions are so powerful and beautiful because they they're, they like, they're like the alarm bells. They're like the sentinels on your castle wall saying, Oh, mayday, something's coming in. We got to deal with this. And if you keep ignoring them and you keep stomping them down, think about stress. They say, Oh, it's just stress. It's just stress. Don't worry about it. Stress can kill. Stress can lead to heart attacks and hypotension and all sorts, you know, like the medical things that it brings about. You're under stress. It leads to emotion. Your body is telling you, you're burning out. The key to avoiding burnout is checking in regularly. How am I doing? Where am I at? And what need do I need to feel? So it comes back to that self-awareness and the self-care required to fill all of those needs. And self-care is not pedicures and bubble baths. Pedicures are not facials and whatnot. Self-care is any conscious and intentional act that you have decided to take in order to meet your own needs. Again, conscious and intentional. If I'm going to go get a pedicure and I'm sitting there in that chair and the whole time I am thinking, Ugh, I need to be doing this. I should be doing that. I, sh I you know, I'm, I'm falling behind on this. Or if I'm on my phone working on emails and whatnot, how is that self-care? How did I fill my cup? I was draining it faster than I was filling it. If, however, I consciously set the intention, I'm going to get a pedicure and I'm going to give myself this time so that I can feel better. Then at the end of that, I don't feel bad that I didn't work. I don't feel bad that I didn't get all these other things done because I consciously chose to fill my own cup, which meant that I am consciously choosing to put myself higher on the priority list and avoid burnout. I'm not going to get that far because I chose to give myself something. That's reading a book. That's anything. And the other thing about self-care is it varies for every single 
one of us. I tell people, I want you to go write a list about all of the things that bring you joy. Everything that brings you joy. And the next time you do it, instead of doing it mindlessly, I want you to stop and set the intention, I'm doing this to fill my cup. Because now you've taken it from a, an unconscious, I'm just doing this kind of thing to a, oh yeah, I'm filling my cup. I'm plugging in for a little while. And you will be amazed at how much self-care you actually do do mm -hmm. and how much you are filling your cup all the time. I have a girlfriend who loves to garden and she doesn't look at it as self-care. She's out there and she loves, she'll tell me about how she's pulled all these tomatoes and she's going to make this mm -hmm. great zucchini thing and whatever for dinner and whatnot. <laughs> and, and I'm like, that is so cool. Right. And then, um, I was like, so what did you do for self-care this week? And she's like, oh, nothing. I worked in the garden. I did this and I did that. And I said, is working in the garden a joy or a burden? And she said, well, huh, it's a joy. I love to do it. And I said, so. Can you switch that intention from it's taken a lot of my time to look at how much time I get to give to myself, right. look at the gift that's there. And once she started shifting that, once she started looking at it in a new light, she realized, okay, gardening actually is self-care. It me. energizes me. Yeah. Yeah. Chopping vegetables so that I can eat healthy, delicious food is self-care. Somebody else, it might be pottery. Somebody might be sanding. Somebody might be running. It is so unique and individual to each and every one of us. And it shifts. One day it may be this and another. It may, one day it may be coffee and tea with a friend. And another day it may, may be that you just need quiet alone time, mm -hmm. right? So recognizing all of the things that we do to fuel our cups, to beat that burnout, right? Right. Means that we have this huge plethora of activities that we can draw from to fill our cup, feel better, and then be able to give that energy out to other people who also need it. Bless other people's lives because our lives are so blessed and so full with our own choices to take care of ourselves that now, hey, yeah, sure. You need some help. I totally got you. Right. Right. And you don't feel like a martyr, you know, that's, that's where a lot of people get caught up. You're not full and the little bit you have, you're given to everybody else. It's not an overflowing cup. It's a leaking cup. And yeah. that becomes a problem. That That is one of the, I've been doing this 10 years. I guess we've been talking about self-care three or four. <laughs> that is quite the best definition that I've heard. I think people have gotten to thinking is, is pampering and luxury and and just plug it in whenever I can but conscious and intentional uh, just really brings it home for me and I can even think of things that I do that I have like like your gardener thought of it as work and the and I was getting I was being productive but it was also pouring into myself and making me happy you know when I'd leave there my body and spirit I feel good about my activities like writing I love writing I can go nice. on and on and on all day don't have to talk to anybody me and my curse and my pc and I'm gucci and yes I'm getting something done but it really does uh help me a lot so thank you for that yeah we, you're welcome and and bringing the mind body and spirit all those areas into alignment and understanding how critical that is to the people around you. You mentioned uh, journaling, journaling in our, in our uh, meditation. I'm sorry, you mentioned meditation in our final, you know, minutes here. I'd like to, for you to talk a little bit about misconceptions of meditation and benefits of meditation. Mm. I love this subject. I love every one of them. I, they're just also, I'm passionate about them. Um, meditation is a lot like self-care. Meditation does not have to be the lotus pose. You do not have to sit quietly for an extended period of time. Meditation, my definition of meditation is anything that lets you tune out the world and mm -hmm. tune into yourself. Tune out the world and tune into yourself. So that means that instead of thinking of all the things, it's I'm going to pause for a moment. Now, just like self-care, meditation could be that you're sanding wood because you have a rhythm and you're paying attention to your breathing and you're in that moment. Mm -hmm. You have let everything 
fall away. Not all of us have the ability to sit in lotus pose. It drives us absolutely nuts. <laughs> we just, or we oh. just don't have, right? Or I don't have flexibility either. So. <laughs> right? right? I don't care if you stand on your head. I don't care if you're laying down on the ground or running or walking through a labyrinth or whatever that is. But meditation is another one of those things that is so unbelievably independent. It is. It is, again, unique for every single one of us. What brings you peace? Writing can be a meditation for you. Because you are there, the world has gone away, and you're just sinking in to the moment. Mm -hmm. You are present in the here and the now. I'm not saying that lotus pose is wrong. I am not saying that sitting quietly, transcendental meditation is wrong. What I am saying is it might be the wrong one for you right now mm -hmm. because it's not for everyone. It may be right now, five minutes sitting in a darkened bathroom is exactly what you need. It might be that five minutes or an hour on a drive on Sunday taking in the beautiful scenery that is there is exactly what you need. Meditation. What lets the world fall away mm -hmm. so that you can tune into you? It is as simple, literally, it is as simple as one slow, deep breath when you recognize that you're going over a three. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to ask if I'm okay and what I need to do. It's that simple. Every one of us can mm -hmm. meditate. Every one of us has the ability to. It's just a matter of redefining it. Maybe the word meditation stresses you out and you just don't like it, right? right? So rename it. Maybe it's just peaceful sitting. Maybe it's, oh, I'm just going to be for a little while or I'm going to, whatever that word is that works for you, mm -hmm. rename it. I I love journaling. It is a huge thing in my life. Um, I have a million different journals, but I don't like the word journal because somebody read mine once when I was a kid and I got in trouble for what I wrote in there. <laughs> so I don't like to journal. I renamed it. Now, every one of them is my musings and I muse all. Your musings? Is that what you musings. say? Your musings. Yes. Lovely. Yeah. So I have a ton of different, different musings. Mm -hmm. I have a ton of different books and ways that I muse and I just let it go and let it flow. But I had to rename it from journaling to musing. So rename meditation. What works for you? I'm going to go let the world fall away. I'm going to go tune in to me. I'm going to have five minutes peace. Whatever that works for you and however that works for you. As long as it's a moment that you are intentionally back to that conscious intentional, right? Mm -hmm. Intentionally tuning into the moment and what's there, your heartbeat, your breath, the space that you're in, let everything else go. Nice way to bring it full circle. You brought us back to that below a three intentional consciousness. And what's really resonating with me is that you need to think about what's triggering you what soothes you, what brings you joy, and own your stuff. <laughs> Start with that, own your stuff, because none of this happens until you do that. Yeah. You cannot have somebody else give you joy. When somebody says, I need to find joy, I've lost joy, da da da, da. you can't get it from outside. You cannot mm -hmm. get self-care from outside. Mm -hmm. You cannot get meditation from outside. Every bit of this is internal. When you are above a three, it's inside. What yeah. do you need? And how can you meet that need so that you can live a better life, so that you can be more at peace, so that you can enjoy what is before you? Every one of us needs to step back and step in to our truth, step into our reality and be as authentic as we can possibly be, recognizing that we all have flaws. Yes. We all have challenges. Yes. And, and that's okay. We are all also trying to live our best lives.
Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to say, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. I am a work in progress. So this has been delightful, I'm sure, after hearing all these great strategies, tips, definitions. Some people have just reframed their whole day. At least I know I have. And I'd love for them to know, our listeners, how to get in touch with you, how to find you online, offline. Tell us your website and how to find you on social media, Crystal. Yeah, I am at Crystal Jakowski on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. My website is crystaljakowski.com, and I have online courses and in-person courses and individual classes. And I also have a podcast, Breathe In, Breathe Out with Crystal Jakowski that has guided meditations and all sorts of just wonderful insights. So feel free to reach out. And even if I'm not the one that ends up guiding you on your journey and helping you get more in tune with your inner person, you know, your higher self and true you. I really hope that your listeners choose in and find someone who really does click with them so that they can start turning the ship around. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Thank you.